The stock market just had its worst week in a year, and days of 1% sell-offs are becoming commonplace. Is it the start of a stock crash, a minor correction, or just a quick dip investors should be buying? Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here with your weekly market update, 9 a.m. Eastern, every Monday morning, all the stocks to watch this week and the news you need to see. I'm gonna highlight where we are in the bull market cycle, how much lower stocks could go, and why 2024 will see higher stock prices. Stick around for news this week and important updates for shares of Alibaba and Netflix. But first, if you've ever wondered what's in my portfolio or want to see the stocks I'm buying, you can now by joining me on the Blossom Social Investing app. The app was created by YouTuber Brandon Beavis for investors and by investors. I just started using it last year and loved the app for getting ideas as well as sharing my own portfolio. And this is not just another social media app. You can connect your brokerage accounts or just input your portfolio to track all your stocks in one place. You're going to see insights like portfolio percentages and average dividend yield across the entire group. You'll also be able to join more than 100,000 investors in the social feed to see what everyone else is talking about. I've shared my portfolio on the app and it's totally free to download. So look for the link I'll leave in the description or just scan the QR code here and check it out. Back to our main topic though, stocks fell the most last week in more than a year and more importantly with bigger, more often moves to the downside. Stocks in the S&P 500 have closed more than a percent lower on three days in just the first half of this month compared to just three days more than a percent lower in the previous five months combined. And a lot of times that's how stock crashes or at least corrections start with those greater swings to the downside as small catalysts to that downside take over and, and investors no longer prop the market up with buying. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ indexes are now down more than 2% from their highs while the Dow is down nearly 5% on greater losses in financials, industrials, and the healthcare sector. But is it the start of a stock crash, a new bear market, or should you use it as a buy the dip opportunity? So here I want to review where we're at in this bull market, risks to the stock crash, and why I think this is just a quick correction before we see higher prices later this year. Data by McKinsey on bull and bear markets only goes through 2019, but with over 60 years of history, it's clear that bull markets don't generally die so fast. Stocks in the S&P 500 have been rising for just 18 months since the end of the last bear market, that's in October 2022, and are up 43% over the period. Compare that with an average length of bull markets at 55 months and an average gain of 144%, and this bull should not be tired yet. Now, the bear case is that stocks do appear expensive when you look at that price-to-earnings valuation. The S&P 500 touched 26 times on a P.E. ratio this month, well above the 10-year average at just under 22 times P.E. While it's not those nosebleed heights that we saw during the pandemic, stocks are clearly expensive at this point. That goes doubly true for stocks in the market-leading sectors, like technology, which is trading 40% higher than its 10-year average price-to-earnings ratio, and communication services, trading 22% more expensive than that long-term average. But as we look here at the sector P.E. ratios against that long-term average there in green on the green bars, not all sectors are so expensive, with four of the 11 stock sectors still trading at discounts to those long-term averages, including energy, which is 15% below that 10-year P.E. average, real estate 14% below, utilities 10%, and consumer staples trading right at its long-term average. Now, there are three primary risks to the market right now. It's going to be inflation and higher rates for longer, higher oil prices weighing on the consumer spending, and just generally those high valuations for stocks. While consecutive readings from the Consumer Price Index, that CPI report on inflation, have confirmed that inflation is not coming down as fast as expected, it's still likely to moderate a little through the end of the year. That rapid drop in inflation's pace from the 9% peak to last year's 3% annual rate in March gave the market a false sense of hope in it, and investors had penciled in as many as six rate cuts this year. Now that hope for a return to cheap money rates has been destroyed with those higher inflation reports. According to the CME Group FedWatch tool, which uses interest rate futures to show what investors are predicting or forecasting for rate cuts, Investors now see just 56% chance the Fed even cuts rates in its July meeting, and most likely only two rate cuts this year. So that is weighing on stocks, that interest rates will stay higher and potentially limit economic growth, but while inflation isn't coming down as fast as it was, it's not necessarily jumping higher either. Energy prices are pushing that headline number up, and a lot of the additional costs tied to home prices like property taxes and insurance are keeping that core number pretty sticky. While it's unlikely either of these factors are going to come down soon, I think a lot of that bad news and in inflation is now priced into stocks. So as the rate stagnates at this level, 
it's not likely to get worse for stocks. As for high valuations on stock sectors and some individual stocks, I think Q1 earnings season is going to go a long way to relieving that pressure and supporting the stock market. As we move into earnings season, analysts expect companies in the S&P 500 to report earnings growth of 0.9% over the same three-month period last year. Now, that's not fantastically high, but would still be the third straight quarter of profit growth. Better than that, though, is the fact that companies almost always beat expectations and that actual earnings growth is going to be much higher. Companies have beaten earnings expectations in 37 of the last 40 quarters. That's 10 years, with the only exceptions in 2020 and 2022. Over the past decade, actual earnings have actually been 6.7% higher than estimates. For the full year, estimates are for corporate profits to grow by 10% on revenue growth of just under 5% and for earnings to grow even faster next year. What this means is twofold. First, with those earnings set to grow, that price to earnings valuation on stocks won't look quite so expensive. A higher P.E. ratio will be justified and, and investors are willing to pay it if those earnings are still growing, so that's going to take some stress off the market. Also, though, it means high interest rates may not be the albatross hanging over corporate profits that investors believe. If companies can continue this pace of profit growth, even with the 10-year treasury at 4.5%, then rate cuts aren't as important as the market may have thought. That means stocks can continue higher, even if the odds of a rate cut fall this year. Now, that's not to say that the market will stop falling immediately. A lot of times, these price corrections take 5 to 10% off the highs before we see any real support. On a 5% correction, that would mean another 2.4% lower on the S&P 500, probably down to around 5,000 on the index, but I would be buying on the dip at that point. And within individual sectors, utilities look really good going into earnings with estimates for 23% profit growth and the sector still trading at that cheap discount to the long-term PE ratio. Not only are utility stocks cheap, but the market is just starting to clue into the reality of booming electricity demand due to AI and crypto processes. And when utilities, you want to focus on the nuclear and the independent producers that can sell their excess capacity to those data centers. So stocks like Constellation Energy, NRG Energy, Public Services Enterprises, and NextEra Energy. Looking at the stocks I'm watching this week, Alibaba Group, ticker BABA, looked like it was on the way to building higher as the stock rose 4.5% through Thursday of last week, bouncing higher after founder Jack Ma released a pep talk to the company. Friday's harsh drop of nearly 5% wiped out all those gains and took the stock back to just above $71 a share. Now, this appears to be support territory, around $71 each, and the stock could find its way back up to $75 and higher leading up to the earnings in a month. The company has been aggressive in its cloud services pricing, which could ding profits a little bit, but it's likely going to help it beat on that top-line revenue growth. Netflix, ticker NFLX, reports earnings Thursday with investors expecting 56% earnings growth to $4.51 a share on 13.6% revenue growth. Those great expectations are dwarfed, though, by 7 to 8 million subscribers expected to have been added to the service in the first quarter. With the company more than six months into its password sharing crackdown, the subscriber additions are going to get harder to come by and it's going to be more difficult to live up to those expectations for growth. Now, if the stock does fall on that disappointing subscriber growth, long-term investors should consider picking up more shares on the dip as the company remains the standout leader in streaming. Zscaler, ticker ZS, is down nearly 30% from its February high on management's outlook for 24% revenue growth this year. That would be a disappointment following 30% plus in prior years. Investors have sold the stock on fears that growth no longer supports that higher valuation. While the slowdown in growth would mean lower valuation multiples, this is still a company leading in a strong, universal trend that cybersecurity. Even if the shares do come down further near term, the long-term outlook is still such that investors should think about picking up the stock at this price for a great long-term return. Giving you the bigger picture here with the Sector Spider Sector Tracker, all 11 stock sectors did finish lower last week, though surprisingly, the growth sectors like technology and consumer discretionary and communication services outperformed the market. Generally, in down weeks, you would expect the stocks in those riskier sectors to fall further than the rest of the market. It could be a clue, though, to the resiliency in these three sectors and potentially good news in Q1 earnings coming over the next few weeks. If earnings are good enough to set in sectors like tech, communication services, uh, consumer discretionary, it could be enough to lift the broader market back into that positive territory. Looking at that tech sector, it is now underperforming the broader market for the year, but looking closely, we see it's largely just a dichotomy between those continuing to run higher and the few that have stumbled. 
Look no further than sector heavyweights Microsoft and Apple. Ticker MSFT has up 12% and Apple is down 8% for the year. Other key drivers of the sector return are NVIDIA, which is up 78% so far this year, Broadcom up 20%, and Salesforce up 11%, while Intel is down 29%, Adobe has fallen 20%, and Accenture is down 10%, all giving back some of those last year's gains. It will be a slow economic news week, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a dull week for stocks. We'll see housing data throughout the week and retail sales reported on Monday with expectations for half a percent growth above the 0.3% growth reported last month. The data should all come together to show that the economy is optimistically continuing to do well. More important though is going to be the nine members of the Fed with speaking engagements this week, including Chair Powell on Tuesday. Stocks cheered Thursday when Fed Presidents Williams and Collins both quoted saying that they still expect cuts this year. The market has been more attuned to these speeches lately as that persistent inflation has brought those doubts into rate cuts that could drive stocks higher. Now looking through the scheduled speeches and where each speaker falls on that hawk dove analysis on rates. Remember, hawks are those favoring higher rates for longer, while doves are more amenable to cutting rates sooner than later. The biggest risk then is probably going to be on Wednesday and Thursday when Fed board member Bowman and Atlanta Fed President Bostic both have planned speeches. Both of those are notable, notable hawks on interest rates. The big news, of course, is going to be Tuesday with Chair Powell's speech at 115 Eastern. The best opportunity for upside could be Chicago Fed President Goolsby on Friday. Join me on the Blossom Social app, see the stocks in my portfolio, and join over 100,000 investors with the link in the description below. Or click on the video to the right for the one index fund every investor needs in their portfolio. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.